Welcome back, everybody. Former Skyline High School standout quarterback Jake Heap's collegiate career saw him contributing at three universities, BYU, Kansas, and Miami. His NFL career included stints with the New York Jets and the Seattle Seahawks, but Jake may have finally found his true calling back home. We're happy to have him here in Seattle, helping shape the next generation of athletes as the head coach at the Russell Wilson Quarterback Academy and as a contributor to 710 ESPN Seattle. Please welcome Jake Heaps. It's nice to meet you. Hey, it's nice to meet you too. Thanks and for so having me. I'm very excited for you. You're a young father with a young two-year-old. How's it going? It's been great. It's uh, we, We're his parents. We're loving it. Jackson's been awesome. Uh, watching him grow and do new things every day. We're we're having a blast. Yeah, it changes you as a person. It, to become it truly a does. You know, you, you hear your parents talk about it all the time, <laughs> and you're like, yeah, yeah, okay. Right. But when he came into this world, it just totally changed everything. Hey, can you describe what, what was different for you as a result of him being here? Um, you know, I think just me as a person, I've just really tried to make sure that I'm being the best version of myself every day, yeah. not only for myself, but for my family, my wife, and There's my a son. Picture. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not yeah. just a cliche. I, I, yeah. You know, you. you as you say, you hear it from your parents and you think, yeah, yeah. And then right. it is so transformative to be responsible for a little human. Absolutely. And, and to deal with that. I'm yeah. happy for you. Thank you. Happy for you. How old were you when you started playing football? Um, I was actually seven years old. I was one of those kids that was dying to get out there. Yeah. My parents put me in different sports. I was playing soccer for a little while and we actually got done with a soccer game and we were driving back home and I looked out the window and saw a football practice and was like, Mom, I got to do that. I want to do that. Yeah. Do you know why it was so appealing? You know, I, I watched it on TV, but it just looked so fun, just the pads and hitting and <laughs> throwing the ball and all that. It just was something that really drew my attention. You weren't always a quarterback. No, actually, my first year, uh, I was a offensive lineman. Uh, I wasn't the biggest kid. Uh, that's why I wasn't there, but I, I actually was really grateful for that because it taught me how to get my feet wet and to get physical. I was mm -hmm. a shy kid. I was always taught don't hit and things like that. So now yeah. put on the pads and be physical was was challenging for me my first year. It was a feeling out process. And then after that, um, I played quarterback and the rest is history. Right. Do you, did you play baseball or anything first? What? Yes. Uh, I ask, Actually, basketball was my first love. Yeah. I uh, played baseball. Um, those were the three sports, basketball, baseball, football, were my passions and um, played that for a long time all the way up until high school. And then I played basketball and and then eventually kind of singled out into, into football. Into football. Mm -hmm. I remember you from high school because you're a couple years older than my son. So, and he did not go to Skyline. He went to Eastside Catholic, but mm. you know, we knew what was up with you yeah. and you were so widely hailed. And I, I always wondered, is that fun or is that weird when you're that age? What was that right. like? Well, it's just, I think it's having a perspective. I think for me at, at that age, I didn't know any different. It was just kind of my life at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was something that I had always worked for. I was a very motivated kid from an yeah. early age. I think in the fifth or sixth grade, I turned to my parents and said, hey, I, I really want to be an NFL quarterback. And I want to start trying to become more advanced. Mm -hmm. And and so I was going to quarterback training and doing all that. And, and so I just always had my goals set high. And uh, when all of that came, ultimately all I focused on was I just wanted to be a, the best Skyline quarterback that I could be and everything else kind of fell into place and, and it was a blast. We had a great run. That's awesome. Um, when you got to college, things didn't entirely go the way the plan was, right? right? Yes. Tell, tell us a little bit about how that unfolded. Yeah, so I coming out of high school, three state straight, uh, three straight state champions. Not uh, bad, right? Yeah, not, not bad. 42, or 40 and two as a starter, which was 42 and zero, you know. <laughs> Uh, That's how competitive you are. Right, you still yeah, resent still, those two. Still bothers me to this day. Um, and was the number one quarterback coming out of high school. And so there was a lot of expectations yeah. for me and for myself. Um, and was kind of on this path that I had always dreamed and envisioned. And my first year at BYU went great. I uh, was a freshman All-American, broke records, and you know looked like uh, everything was hit, going the right way. And then uh, that sophomore season, it just things turned and um, ended up transferring and and then uh, had a kind of a cross-country journey from there and ended up at the University of Miami with my wife all the way uh, opposite ends of the country. Yeah, can't uh, get from much home. further away. Right. Uh, and so it was, it was tough. It was hard. Um, but I think it was one of those things that made me a better player and a better person overall because I had my perspective in, in one place in time and it opened myself up. And I really learned about myself through all that adversity. 
Uh, and it also tested me how much I truly love the game. Yeah. Did you have an injury? What do you think made things turn? No, I didn't have an injury. I think it's uh, circumstances of right time, right place. Yeah. And then also there's things that I could have done better as a player. Uh, so it wasn't all circumstance, but my performance wasn't as good as where it could be. And I think over time, my psyche, the confidence that I once had when I was in high school, I felt like I could conquer the world. I just didn't have that quite as, as much when I was in college. And, and as a quarterback, you have to be supremely confident. I can't even imagine. I really can't. And such a lot of pressure when you're really pretty young. But it yeah. sounds like, uh, talking to you, you've got a good head on your shoulders and a good perspective about the rest of life outside of athletics. And I imagine that that makes you a wonderful mentor and motivator for young people now. How did you get together with Russell Wilson? I appreciate that. I uh, actually started getting into quarterback training as soon as I got into professional football. Mm -hmm. Just in the off season, being able to be around these high school kids, I really wanted to give back. And like you said, all those experiences that I had, I wanted these kids to not only succeed and be great quarterbacks, but when they get to that next level, give them a real perspective of what it's like. Uh, yeah. Not just, it's not uh, all the glory that people think. It's, it's a lot of hard work. There's right. a lot that goes into it. And so I want to prepare them to be successful now and in life and further down the road in their career. Um, and so with the Russell Wilson Quarterback Academy, I was already doing my own quarterback academy. Mm -hmm. Ended up being teammates with Russell Wilson. We became close friends and he saw the work that I was doing and was like, man, I, I really want to be a part of this. And so we came together and opened up a business together. And so it's been fun being partners with him and having these kids get this unique yeah. opportunity. Well, and you're the head coach, right? Yes. So that's, um, that's a lot of responsibility. Yes. And it does require that you are part of their lives in terms of how to be good men, how to yeah. be good people, um, how to pursue your dream, but also be okay if things don't go exactly as you hope they do. Correct. Because it's all about resilience in life, right? You yeah. know, when things don't go right, that's when you find out. Uh, who your friends are and what you're made of, and yeah. that's that happens to everybody. So it seems to me like you bring kind of a wealth of experience for a person your age. Right. That's that's part of the deal for me is that I'm very close to this. Uh, I'm very close to where they're at right, right. now and where they want to be, and I've been able to experience not only on the high school level, but I we have college kids that are in college now, and um, and hopefully we get more guys going into the NFL eventually. Uh, so for me, it's just about being there. I, I view myself more as a mentor than a coach. Uh, it, being on the field and the X's and O's and all those things are really important, mm -hmm. but it's about teaching those kids how to be great young men and to help them be successful in life, whether it's football or post-football. I want them to be difference makers in, in their community and in the workplace. That's awesome. Uh, mentor us as fans for a minute because one of the things that worries me um, about the way people treat professional athletes is that we forget that they're human beings. Right. They have families, they have feelings, they have ups and downs like everybody else. It's, mm -hmm. it's an expectation set that we put not only on pro athletes, but on people who are actually kids, who right. are in college or in high school. What could we do to kind of better understand, um, have better perspective as fans in the way that we talk about and treat athletes. Yeah, I think you bring up an excellent point. I actually ran into a media member the other day that uh, was singling out a high school kid and, and talking not only poorly about their performance, but you know some of the things that they're struggling with off the field, in in public, in the media. And, I don't get it. And it's it's really sad, and uh, it's something that. In the professional level, it, it's it's its own animal. It's it's totally different, and I get people are passionate about their sports and uh, they want the best, and we all do. But I think as athletes, like you said, we're all human, and we're people that unfortunately our jobs. Well, not unfortunately, we all love it, but our job is just out in front for everybody to see, right. and everybody gets to critique it. And so it's a it's a unique situation, and. Um, and the words that you have are powerful and can be harmful. And, um, and I think it's something that criticism is a good thing to a certain extent. And that once you start getting to the point where you're starting to demean someone, they have not only themselves, but they have a family, they have loved ones who are a part of this journey with them and they, they experience that too. So I would say before you think about tweeting or 
making some outrageous comment, think about that. Think about their families. Think about how you would want to be talked about in your workplace performance. Yeah, it's it really isn't part of the price of a ticket that you get to do whatever you want. Absolutely. <laughs> We're all humans. I'm so glad you're going to stick around. We're going to talk about the Seahawks Yeah, game. fired up for it. We have linked more information about Jake and the Russell Wilson Quarterback Academy online. And then Jake is going to stay with us and help break down yesterday's Seahawks victory over the Dallas Cowboys back after this quick break. Bernard Law figured out my car accident was worth $290,000, 19 times more than the insurance offer. What's your case really worth? Call us and find out free, 800-690-1000. When DC politicians voted to gut health care for people with pre-existing conditions, I decided to run for Congress myself. Because career politicians don't fix problems, they just make our problems worse. I'll take on the insurers and drug companies that jack up costs, and I'll work with anyone to protect Medicare and Social Security from cuts. I'm Dr. Kim Schreier, and I approve this message because I don't take corporate PAC money, so our families will always come first. Do you or a loved one suffer from depression? The Northwest Clinical Research Center is looking for adult volunteers to participate in a research study evaluating an investigational drug for depression. Call 425-453-0404 or visit our website, nwstudies.com. Again, that's 425-453-0404 and online at nwstudies.com. Bernard Law figured out my car accident was worth $290,000, 19 times more than the insurance offer. What's your case really worth? Call us and find out free, 800-690-1000. I like it. Football music. The Seahawks pulled together a 24-13 win over the Dallas Cowboys yesterday in front of a stadium full of raucous 12s at Century Lake. One of the highlights was the exemplary play of safety Earl Thomas, but this morning he's also the focus for other reasons. Jake Heaps from 710 ESPN Seattle is back with his recap. Um, so put this in perspective for us. I love Earl Thomas. Yeah, I, I do too. I love Earl, and he played so well. He's in the last year of a huge contract, and now we don't know what's happening. He missed a couple of practices. What's your insight on what's happening? Right. There's there's a lot of drama. I mean, there's no way to cut it. There's a lot of drama going on, and Earl didn't participate in any of the offseason activities. He showed up uh, just before week one on Wednesday to get ready for the first game. Uh, he practiced the, the week two, and now all of a sudden in week three, he just says, hey, I'm not going to practice. I'm not going to participate in any of the uh, major practices yeah. and uh, he says he doesn't want to risk an correct. injury yes and post game he said that and and so it's just very foreign uh, to see this not only in a normal workplace but also in the NFL yeah and so Earl's kind of put the Seahawks and the organization in a really tough spot because the Seahawks I can't imagine want to go through the whole season with Earl just not practicing it sets a precedent that you don't want your players doing and they need to make a decision ultimately on whether they give him an extension mm -hmm. or whether they trade him, in, in my mind, in my view. Um, and I think that's what Earl wants too. He wants to have this organization decide what his future is going yeah. to be. And Do you he's think really he cares which way it's going, whether it's trade or stay, or he just wants to get past this? Yeah, I think ultimately he would love to stay in Seattle. He's actually built a life here. He's, yeah. His family, his, his wife's here, his daughter's going to school here. I think ultimately it's what he would love to have happen, but he just wants to have security. He wants to ultimately get paid the way he views himself getting paid, and he wants to be a part of an organization that quote unquote respects him. And the NFL is brutal in that way. The minute you're not useful, boom, Correct. you go. Correct, it is a cutthroat business. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so tell me about the good from yesterday. What did you take away as, as good stuff? Well, I think the obvious thing is we got our first win, right? Yes. Uh, we were, <laughs> as fans, I think we were all kind of looking at this and very nervous. Uh, could we go 0 and 3? And the Seahawks answered that, you know, with a win and at Century Link, the place was rocking. Yep. And now we have an opportunity to even out our record and go 2 and 2. Um, the other positives that I saw was the offense finally had an identity. Uh, they were able to run the football very effectively with Chris Carson. He was so good he, yesterday. He was great. Um, so, he just finishes a run so well. He just exudes his effort. Right, and Margaret, I think that's the key is 
what he did wasn't a big stat filler. He got over 100 yards, but he just ran extremely hard and, yep. and made the tough yards. And the offensive line played much more improved, giving Russell Wilson time to do his thing. Yes. And Russell, I thought, really took the game over in terms of managing the game, being the top five quarterback that he is, yeah. and doing the subtle things that most people don't see in terms of changing the play at the line of scrimmage, making mm -hmm. sure that they're in the right protection calls. And he actually changed the tempo uh, in the middle of drives and it actually led to the Jaron Brown touchdown pass he saw the defense was kind of tired and he went up tempo and got them off guard and that's so that's awesome yeah, it's, that's it's great awesome and you see. see that obviously when you're watching the game I'm just right. yelling indiscriminately it's, <laughs> right it's fun as a fan of watching football but it's even more fun being a guy that's been in that organization yeah. in and that you QB know room. him as right, well right and so, so it's that's fun. pretty cool okay so the not so good yeah, I, I think really the one thing that you could point to in terms of the game, I have other concerns, but the in terms of the game is the start on offense. They they haven't yet scored a touchdown on their opening drive. They were really struggling to get things going in the first quarter. And I think I know that's something that they want to improve. They got it going in the second quarter, and they never looked back since. We've been but, doing this for a long time. Right. The second half thing. Right. I, it's. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I think for fans it gets frustrating, and luckily in the second quarter they were able to get it jump started, yep. and that we were able to take an early commanding lead, and then we were able to sit on that. But I think we, I think that organization, that offense wants to get going in that first right. quarter. Right, that makes sense. Okay, for you, the player of the game. Uh, for me, the player of the game, uh, we already talked about him, but it was Chris Carson. Mm -hmm. He did all the dirty work. He didn't have huge open running lanes, but it was almost kind of Marshawn Lynch-esque yeah. in terms of how hard he ran, and he got those uh, hard-earned yards. He had 32 carries, 102 yards rushing. That's a little bit over th uh, three yards a carry, which isn't fantastic, but what he brought to the team was able to bring a balance and that's what this offense has needed yeah well yes and i loved that he seemed to get stronger through the game he yes. was showing great effort at the end of the game he must have been tired i was tired watching him <laughs> and i didn't know how he was going to do that so okay now we're looking ahead at arizona mm -hmm. um and i'm sort of lost i have i can't remember whether they were that good or that bad last year. And I know our division is tougher. Tell me a little bit yeah. about what we're looking so at. So Arizona is kind of falling on the decline. I think when you've looked at Seattle and you've looked at Arizona, they've been the top two teams in, right. in the NFC West. And now you see the emergence of the Rams and Seattle's kind of retooling as Pete Carroll likes to call it. And, and now Arizona's kind of fallen off. And, and so they went from being an early pick last year uh, and they were able to get Josh Rosen in the first round but ultimately this is a team that's really struggling and searching and trying to find answers for who they are they got a new head coach uh, they have a new quarterback in place in Sam Bradford who hasn't played the best and now they put in Josh Rosen at the end of the game last game and so now there's a little bit of a QB controversy so they're searching they're trying to figure themselves yeah. out and it's a perfect opportunity for the Seahawks to go into Arizona and get that second win of the season. Well let's hope we do because that place has been tough for us in the past but as you say it's a different team and the Rams are the ones we're really worried about. Correct? Right right I, and I think the biggest thing moving forward is the defense has been able to play well I think they'll continue to do that versus this Arizona offense. But the most encouraging thing is, again, finding that groove and identity on offense. And go. It, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't perfect, but they'll be able to build off of it and get yeah. better. And McDougal, how good is he? Oh, he's special. That was super fun to watch. I've become a defensive fan as a result yeah. of seeing the Seahawks through the years all of a sudden. But he was awesome. Thank you so much, Jake. It was Absolutely. great to meet, yeah. meet you. Excuse me. <clears throat> I still have some uh, nacho meatball <laughs> going on. The Seahawks hit the road again next weekend to take on the Arizona Cardinals. Kickoff is scheduled for around 1 in the afternoon. And still ahead for us today, a renowned Latina playwright tackles divisions in race and class through humor. We're going to meet the stars of the play, one of them, Native Gardens, after this quick break.